that they are moving more towards uh, fair regulations, trying to create a level playing field. So in some ways, uh, these measures by China is making it safer for investors, including foreign investors. I think so far everything we've seen, and we've looked at it quite a bit, uh, shows that um, the China issues are much more insulated than uh, in previous crises, um, like 2015-16. We're not there yet, but China internet and broader North Asia mm. is where uh, we are thinking of uh, focusing our attention in the coming three to six months. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller and Keely Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, September the 15th. Our top stories today. Double trouble for China. The economy is being hurt by government coronavirus controls and tight limits on property financing. Back at work, Congress returns from vacation to face a wide range of battles. Everything from President Biden's economic agenda to a potential government shutdown. And on a record run, natural gas prices in Europe just keep rising. We'll look at what is to blame. Good morning from London, everybody. I'm Anna Edwards, in for Francine Lacroix this morning. Matt Miller is with me here in London for a change. Kaylee Lines is with us, of course, as usual, over in New York. And Kaylee, what are you seeing in these markets? A lot of talk about inflation over the last couple of days, where you are and where I am. But it was the delta impact on the Chinese data mm -hmm. really driving the, chi the, uh, the Asia session. Yeah, absolutely, Anna. It was a deeply red session in Asia overnight. Sure, there were some exceptions, the Kospi and South Korea being one, but you had Japanese equities lower. And both Hong Kong and China fell by more than 1%. As you said, weakness in the Chinese economic data for August. Retail sales only up 2.5%, well short of the 7% estimate. You also had a contraction in construction investment. So it really shows the restrictions around COVID-19 and property regulation are having an impact. And speaking of regulation having an impact, I would point to Chinese tech stocks lower for a third day in a row. The HS Tech Index down about 3% in the overnight session. And then the regulatory spike has now, uh, or plunge, I should say, has now come for casino stocks with regulators in Beijing saying they're going to impose restrictions on operators in Macau. That took Win Macau and some of its peers deeply lower overnight. Win Macau down 29% in the session. In other asset classes, I would point to iron ore because you did have steel production in that data uh, coming down. That weighed on iron ore, which actually was lower for its six day in a row. Futures down 4.2% and you are getting a little bit of a haven bid for the Japanese yen. One of the uh, outperformers in G10 FX is stronger against the dollar by about three tenths of one percent. Now here in the U.S., as you said, Anna, it was all about the inflation data yesterday. That took both stocks and bond yields lower in yesterday's session. Today, though, futures are in positive territory at the moment on S&P E-minis, up about a quarter of 1%, and we go absolutely nowhere in the Treasury market. We are right at that 128 level where we ended the day yesterday after that CPI print. It is a, weekly, a weaker dollar story today, a weaker by about two-tenths of 1%, and then I would just point to oil gaining for a third day now, a fourth day now, actually, in a row, up the better part of 1%. It's all about the supply side issues, Matt. That is eating crude prices with WTI North of $71 a barrel. Yeah, we're seeing supply side issues in oil and gas and, and some demand side issues as well here in Europe. Take a look at the mixed picture in terms of equities. First off, we've got a drop in um, the CAC, the IBEX, and the FTSE MIB. So down in the Iberian Peninsula, in the core of Europe, not doing a lot to the upside. You can see the DAX uh, in Germany is little changed. The FTSE in the UK here in the UK is little changed. There are some gains if you look up into Scandinavia, Norway, which is just barely on the top of the map there, um, is green. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. If you take a look at the broad broader stock 600 index, you'll see losses, but you do see gains in sort of everything Norwegian today. I put the Nucky on here because there are gains in that. Um, there are uh, gains in the euro. Of course, all currency pairs uh, are up against um, uh, uh, the dollar. You can see the euro and the pound here gaining against the dollar. And we also saw big gains for natural gas. Anna, this is something we're going to focus on, but I think it's interesting because you've got kind of a perfect storm. You've got the demand side in Russia as temperatures drop, um, demand is rising. And then on the supply side, you've 
you've got a lack of wind power, you've got a problem with nuclear dropping out, you've got the uh, tropical depression Nicholas in the Gulf yeah. cutting off U.S. LNG. So natural gas just continues to hit record high after record high after record yeah, high. Yeah, and we saw just before the top of this hour, benchmark European gas prices, Matt, surging more than 20% on ice index. So certainly uh, that will remain in focus for us. Let's have a quick check of the other things in focus for us. A look at what is ahead today. We get some U.S. economic data, including MBA mortgage applications and industrial production. So a bit of a focus once again on U.S. data. It's not U.S. CPI, but it could be of interest. At 11 a.m. New York time, ECB Chief Chief economist Philip Lane speaks at the IMFS webinar about the central bank's strategy review and also, Matt, this might interest you, Elon Musk's SpaceX is planning the first all-civilian orbital. The mission bolsters Musk's efforts to make human spaceflights more common. Matt, I wasn't expecting I that line. I am excited. I, I was not trying to suggest that you were common, but I wondered why you ended up in London and not at Cape Canaveral. Yeah, you know what? I'm super pumped about this launch, not just because there are four civilians going up, but because it's going to be a Netflix special. Ah. So we're going to be able to watch the whole thing from, I guess, their, their choosing to their training. Even more reason to be on board, and yet you're here. You won't well, miss I the didn't Netflix make, special. I didn't make the cut, but maybe on the next one. <laughs> maybe on the next one. Okay, starting in China then. Let's uh, get back to our economic focus and the economy took a hit from tough coronavirus restrictions and new curbs on property. Retail sales growth slowed to 2.5% in August, that from a year ago. That was well under economists' estimates. Meanwhile, construction investment, uh, that shrank also. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie joins us here in studio in London to take us through all the details. And Tom, the retail sales number very much in focus because this is all to do with people's, what, confidence to go out and shop and to spend money at a time when the Delta variant was resurging. It's that key pillar of the Chinese economy that has yet to kick back into gear. And if you take that 2.5% number and put it in the context of China's recent history when it comes to retail sales, that is incredibly weak, well below the ESO estimates. So the question is, when does the consumer come back? We've been speaking to economists from Morgan Stanley today. They say it's not going to happen this year. You also saw, as well as the impact of COVID and the Delta and the restrictions that we see that are very tough in China when they just have a handful of cases, you also started to see now in this economic data the impact of this regulatory squeeze. That is important. Construction, for example, contracting 3.2%. Construction, the real estate service, the property service sector, all of that is being tightened and the focus there from China's regulators. Nomura, by the way, coming out and saying the markets are underpricing the risk of a significant slowdown in China. Here's the silver lining. If you're looking for one, the PBOC still has a lot of dry powder. Mm. Many now pricing in another reserve cut. Focus on that triple we're, we're, we're seeing, yeah. by the way, a headline come across on the Bloomberg terminal. China sets a 500 billion yuan annual quota for the southbound bond link. Mm. So um, we've got that news as well as, and by the way, last night on the plane here, I watched Skyfall again. I rewatched <laughs> Skyfall. Is that because you're really missing the new one, which is just delayed and delayed I'm, and yeah, delayed? Yeah, I can't wait for the new Bond. But, you know, in Skyfall, he gets this um, this chip for a casino in Macau. And he, you remember, he goes it and does, cashes yeah. it in for, I think he gets 4 million euros for it. But um, Macau is really hurting right now. I love that link from Skyfall <laughs> yeah. to Macau. Macau is feeling the pain. So you've seen the biggest wipeout in terms of casino stocks in Macau on record. $18 billion. $18 billion. And this is because regulators now, they haven't switched their focus away from tech, but they've started to include the casinos. Absolutely central, of course, for the economy of Macau. And just for the context, it puts Las Vegas in the shade. It's the biggest gaming market in the world. So questions about licenses, oversight from regulators. You've got the likes of JP Morgan coming out, downgrading six operators. That just accelerated the sell-off that we've seen. We're talking Sands, Win, Galaxy. And this is also coming at a time when these casinos already under pressure. Uh, the revenue's down 82% just in the month of August. So further pain for they that They need sector. bond back. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like they do. 007 to the rescue. All right, Tom McKenzie, thank you so much. Can't wait for that movie to finally come out, by the way. But let's go over to Washington, D.C. now. Lawmakers are returning for a busy fall work period, and they face immediate decisions on how to head off a government shutdown and potential federal default, while Democrats push to advance their ambitious $3.5 trillion spending plan. Emily Wilkins, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now from Washington. So, Emily, it's a big budget day. What else do we need to iron out in the next 24 hours?
Well, it is absolutely now crunch time in Washington, D.C., not just on President Biden's giant policy plan, that $3.5 trillion reconciliation package, that social net of safety programs, but on so many other issues as well that have quickly upcoming deadlines. Today's sort of this soft, non-binding deadline for various committees to get their piece of the reconciliation bill to the budget committee. The budget committee will be putting everything together, but then after that, there's still going to be continued negotiations, amendments, and tweaks. And today's deadline is non-binding, so we could see some work after this as well. Uh, basically, this is just sort of another step in the process. We're not quite to the point yet where lawmakers are going to start to vote. And we've seen a lot of concerns emerge around this larger social spending package. We saw lawmakers yesterday raise some concerns about the health care component of it. Uh, there's been of a bit of a stall there. We've heard concerns about some of the taxes, some, some of the provisions that deal uh, with parents leaving money to kids and how that is mm. going to be taxed. So there's still a lot of pieces at play here that need to be figured out. And there's just not a lot of time. Remember, moderate Democrats arranged that on September 27th, the House is supposed to start considering this bipartisan structure plan. And progressives have said, look, if reconciliation isn't done by then, if we can't vote on both together, we aren't going to give you our yes vote for that infrastructure. We'll do it, okay. but not mm. until that larger social spending is done. And Emily, let me ask you about the, the path that the three and a half trillion dollar spending plan has. Uh, through Washington because there was some suggestion just at the margin yesterday that with CPI coming off just a little bit the inflation number not looking as aggressive as it was that maybe for some Democrats who'd focused on it, the dangers around inflation maybe for some moderate Democrats this might be enough to make them think well maybe President Biden isn't about to dangerously inflate the US economy is that something that's going to touch the sides in Washington or is that too too offbeat? I mean, people in Washington were definitely paying attention to the CPI number yesterday. They're definitely paying attention to inflation. De Democrats know that if inflation goes up, that's going to be really bad for their midterm prospects next year. At the same point, Democrats, they realize right now they've got the House, the Senate, and the White House. And that might not be true after November of 2020. And so they want to make sure they're moving getting large policies done that they can then take to voters and say, hey, look at what we were able to do. We were able to reduce the cost of child care, help with elder care, expand Medicare, do things for the climate, do things for education, do things for infrastructure. And the concern among the Democrats is that they're not going to be able to go to voters and that they were able to get those things done. That's really kind of the key priority. But of course, th this is a huge legislative package. You've got many, many opinions from within the Democratic Party on what does and doesn't need to be included and now is really sort of when the rubber hits the road as far as getting negotiations done and making decisions about what will and will not yeah. be in this package. Emily, I just want to briefly touch on some breaking news. We understand that President Biden is going to push for vaccine requirements and meeting with top executives from Walgreens and Microsoft. This is according uh, to Dow Jones. Obviously, this is a big push on the part of the administration and yet there are still millions and millions of people in this country who are, remain unvaccinated. How big of a problem is the ongoing pandemic for President Biden as he tries to push his other agenda matters through Congress? It's definitely a big issue, and that's why you're seeing President Biden really step up his tone in terms of aggressiveness of how much people need to get these vaccinations. You heard it in his speech the other week. You're probably going to hear it again today with this meeting. I mean, President Biden has tried to, you know, ask Americans, encourage Americans, but the fact of the matter is that the American economy is still stalled in part because things can't open fully because of the Delta variant, and there are concerns about what future variants are going to look like. And so for President Biden, he's very much attached his presidency to the end of the COVID pandemic. And he's trying to figure out what measures he needs to take to really make sure that enough Americans are vaccinated, that they can really do a full reopening of the economy and COVID behind them. All right, Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government, thank you so much. I just want to note another breaking headline. Crossing the terminal, the UK-France power cable will be halted until at least October 13th. And we'll have more on that energy crisis in Europe and the UK in just a moment with our very own Eddie van der Vault. But first, I want to take a look at some equities moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. Of course, we were talking with Tom McKenzie about that casino crackdown in China. That is weighing on U.S. casino companies that operate in Macau. Las Vegas stands as one of them. It's down 8% in pre-market trading today after falling nearly 10 
10% yesterday. Another stock moving to the downside is CureVac, of course, a COVID-19 vaccine maker. It halted manufacturing agreements with some manufacturers because of weak demand for that vaccine. It's down 4.5%. And finally, just a quick note of the original meme stock, or one of them, AMC, falling now for a second day. It's down about 2% in early hours. Investors or retail investors seem to be selling some of their formerly favorite names. Anna. Okay, talking of uh, new movie releases as we were earlier. Uh, now, coming up on this program later, we'll be speaking about these market moves, of course, with Trevor Greetham, head of multi-asset at Royal London Asset Management. Get his take on inflation and everything beyond. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards, in for Francine Lacroix this morning. Matt Miller is with me here in London. Kaylee Lines is with us, of course, in New York. Just to recap what Kaylee told us as we were going to break, the UK-France power cable uh, that has been subject to a fire is going to be halted until at least October the 13th. This wouldn't necessarily be a big deal if it weren't for the fact that gas prices are so high in Europe right now. Eddie van der Velt of our Bloomberg Markets Live team joins us here on set in London. Eddie, very good morning to you. This wouldn't necessarily normally be maybe a, a, a red headline across the Bloomberg, right. but today it certainly is, because with gas prices on the rise, disruption to this cable could really matter. Yeah, you know what? And I, 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 I will be the first to admit, I will hold my hand up, I underestimated the seriousness Ooh. of this natural gas story up until now because really I thought look if you cover commodities for any amount of time we talk about supply disruption we talk about shortages all the time we talked about you know peak demand a peak supply of oil back in the 90s and it never came mm. but here's the difference everything that could go wrong for natural gas at the moment for power for power prices is going wrong we're not, we're not getting the wind we are, we are you know we're, we're getting these outages we're, Nord Stream was late there's just these knock-on implications that all seem to be coming through and if we on top of that get a cold winter as early signs we're getting a couple of cold weeks I mean look they just finished so now Berlin can pay Moscow for more nat gas but the temperatures are dropping dropping in Russia so they need the gas themselves. Plus, you've got this tropical depression, uh, Nicholas, I believe it's called in the U.S., which is cutting off U.S. LNG supplies. And LNG was supposed to be the alternative to Nord Stream. Yeah. Now, both of those are offline right now. And by the way, if you look at the GMM right now, the global macro mover screen, which I love because it shows you which assets are moving the most. NatGas, two contracts there have black boxes around them. You only get a black box if it's moving more than three standard deviations right. away from the the 30 day average. So we're just seeing these prices absolutely soar. They are. And, and you know what? You know, even if we do get that new supply of gas coming through, it, we're, we're late into the cycle. And the natural gas system just works like this. During the summer, you are supposed to be pumping these underground storage facilities uh, full. And, and we're not there. We're not there. We're sitting at like something like 70% in much of Europe or across Europe. So we're just not getting the supplies through that we that we want. Yeah, and if you look at the extent to which we have stockpiled, we have stockpiled a lot less, to your point, Eddie, than we would have done in a normal year. Eddie, thank you very much. Eddie van der Velt of our Bloomberg Markets live team. Tonight on Bloomberg, an exclusive conversation with Christine Lagarde, the European Central Bank president, joins us on the David Rubenstein show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations. That is tonight, 9 p.m. in New York. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller in London. Now let's get the first word news and another major missile test in North Korea. Kim Jong-un's regime fired off two ballistic missiles that fell into the waters off the eastern coast. It's the second test in just a week of weapons designed to hit South Korea and Japan. Last week, during a phone call, President Biden suggested the possibility of a face-to-face -face meeting with China's Xi Jinping, but she declined to commit to one. He continues to avoid leaving the country even for major meetings during the pandemic. She hasn't left China in more than 600 days. 
And voters in California have overwhelmingly rejected an attempt to recall Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom. About two thirds of voters answered no to the question of whether he should be removed from office. It's a major win for Democratic leaders who characterize the recall attempt as a power grab by Trump supporters. So Matt, obviously this has major implications for the state of California, but also the Democratic more broadly. And I wonder how this sets us up to the midterm elections that are now just about a year away. Yeah, it's very interesting indeed, but I think it's always important to remember California politics are um, not the same as U.S. nationwide politics, right? It's a very different state. They have different rules and regulations on a number of things. It's very difficult to license a motorcycle or a car, for example, in California compared to the other 49 states. Um, and San Francisco, uh, California, they're just, it's a whole different what would you say? Bowl of tea? Cup of tea? Ball bowl game. of porridge? Ball game. Ball but I'm game. sure we there get that go. from you. Ball yeah, Katie, <laughs> he always brings it back to cars and, and, and in this case, ball games. Sports. Yeah, but Matt, to your point, I think, yes, of course, California is not the rest of the United States, but the basis of this recall really was the pandemic-related restrictions that Newsom had put into place. And we've seen those more heavy in Democratic-leaning states. So if voters are okay with it in Newsom's case, I wonder what the ripple effects of that are, especially considering this Biden administration has had a really tough go of it lately from Afghanistan to the resurgence right. of the pandemic, struggling to get the economic agenda through Congress. So the Democrats kind of need every win that they can get here as those midterms draw closer and closer, Anna. Well, hopefully they can get a win in California. I mean, if they can't get a win in California, it's going to be tough for them to get a win anywhere in the so country. In that, so in that sense, this, uh, this result, not a surprise, yeah. but important that we get the context. Mm -hmm. uh, coming up on the program, Trevor Greetham, head of multi-asset at Royal London Asset Management. We've been covering uh, the spike up in natural gas prices, uh, also the broader commodities rally that we've seen in all, in all kinds of spaces in the commodity markets, not in iron ore, but a lot of others. We'll ask him about that. Also, the inflation push and the latest on the Delta variant. Lots to talk about. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in for Francie Lacroix this morning. Matt Miller is with me here in London. Kayleigh Lines is in New York. And Matt, I am very glad that you did not take a flight to Cape Canaveral, that you actually took a flight to here to London yes. to come and see us. It was pleasant, actually. It wasn't... The German side was really difficult. The mm -hmm. Germans make everything um, bureaucratic and impossible, and you've got to have everything in paper and triplicate. Are you saying that we did not? On the British side, they just said, oh, you're American? Go out, go on through. <laughs> they didn't ask me for my vaccination status. They didn't ask me for my test results. And I'm just, standing pretty close to you. Just the American passport was enough to just... I should be a little worried. Wave me in. This is the new global Britain, perhaps, Kaylee. This is uh, <laughs> greeting Americans with a smile, maybe. Love to hear it. I have to say, I'm really jealous I'm not with you guys there in London. It looks like you're having a good time. I'll just be here by myself in New York, checking, as always, Kaylee, on the I markets. Saw, yes, I saw, I saw a bunch of beef eaters just outside on horses, <laughs> and everyone's driving around in Range Rovers, and there's this grand architecture. It's exactly how we really do live you in would a Disney expect movie. London to be. Mm. <sighs> And I'll be here in New York. Anyway, back to the markets now. We do have stocks in Europe on the back foot this morning. The stock 600 is down just by a few tenths of 1%, but there are some sectors within the index that are underperforming. The biggest underperformer is retail. And I have a sneaking suspicion that has to do with the China data we got overnight uh, with those retail sales growth posting a, a much lower decline uh, growth than expected. Also, when it comes to S&P 500 futures, we're in positive territory. Remember, the index has fallen in six of the last seven days. They've been marginal moves, but still something to note. So we'll see if the gains in the future session can hold come the opening bell in about four hours time. Right now, we're up about two tenths of 1%. No movement really at all in the Treasury market. We're still hovering right around 1.28% on the 10-year yield. More movement, though, for oil. WTI futures now up more than 1%. Higher again today It's all about supply and the tightening of the market. Right now, WTI is trading at $71.31 a barrel. That lift in oil is giving a small lift to some oil-related equities in pre-market trading. Apache is one of them. It's up about 1.3%. But a group of stocks moving to the downside are casino operators, specifically those who operate in Macau. We were talking earlier on in the show about how China is restricting the operations of casino operators there. So that's taking Las Vegas Sounds and Wind Resorts down by more than 7%. You have MGM Resorts down by another 2.5% as well, Matt.
All right, Kaylee, I have to say the continent looks so dreary from here in sun, sunny London. And this chart um, tells a story that is actually the opposite of that. It's down and to uh, the right here, but that's good because this is Italian-German spreads, right? And you want them, Christine Lagarde's job is to keep these spreads as tight as possible. And Anna, it looks like she's doing her job quite well right now. Um, the costs for Italian borrowing are very low relative to German borrowing, and that's what the ECB needs to keep in check. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for a while, it, it, you know, we weren't sure how much the ECB did have that in focus under Christine Lagarde, and it seems that it, that it is still. Let's talk to Trevor Griefham, head of multi-asset at Royal London Asset Management. Uh, I'm torn, Trevor, because there's so much going on on commodities, but I'll come mm. to that in a moment. I'll go to Matt's point around spreads narrowing in Europe, and I, I, does that continue? Is that the direction of travel? Can they, maybe they can't get any tighter. Well, the central banks are clearly trying to have us believe that tapering isn't tapering and tightening won't happen for ages, and they seem to be succeeding. So. You know, for the Fed, we had that whole charade for months about were they talking about talking about tapering. Yep. Um, well, well, the ECB's version is they are tapering, but actually it's just a sort of course correction. And yes. they might untaper later, who knows? And, and the markets seem to be pretty relaxed. It's a recalibration, Matt, wasn't a taper. Yeah, exactly. Calibration, it's not a gotta... taper. But she, if she's going <laughs> to reduce the amount of money, if she's going to reduce the purchases in the months ahead... I mean, it is tapering, right? It's tapering. I mean, you know, I'm old enough to remember rate cuts and rate hikes, and I'm sure you are That's as well. That's very and, retro. <laughs> and, you, and you kind of knew what central banks were doing, and now it's all in this kind of, you know, meta-philosophical area. And I think the markets won't seriously worry about rate hikes for a while. But next year, I think, when we've got through this kind of reopening transition and we find out what BAU looks like, if it's quite strong, if inflation's still pretty high, then I think you'll find is she more difficulty. To, by the way, I joke about Christine Lagarde's job is to keep spreads in check because, of course, she had that gaffe when she first joined the bank saying it's not our job. Right. And, uh, she quickly changed her, her tune. But um, her, her real job, I'd say, is to do what Mario Draghi failed to do and get inflation back to a level that they want to see it with um, you know, sustainable growth alongside. Is she going to be able to do that? I mean, isn't it isn't tapering um, the wrong idea when you still need to boost inflation to a decent level? I, I was listening yesterday to Ben Bernanke speaking, and, and Bernanke would say, "Well, yeah, we can we can get inflation higher and we can get bond yields higher, but a bit of fiscal help would be would be welcome." Mm. And that's what you're not seeing a lot of in Europe. But you're beginning compared to get to the a change US. compared to the US, certainly. I think you're beginning to see a bit of a change, and we'll see what happens with German politics, whether actually that gets a bit of a boost. But with some fiscal support... What do you want to see know, in German... What, what do we need to see in German politics? Well, well, I think what you need to see for sustained growth across the euro area is more fiscal spending in, in mm. Germany. And uh, the sort of German balanced budget has been one of the problems at the core of Europe, really. Um, but you've got lots of, you know, wars on inequality, wars on climate change, you know, going on, wars on COVID, which suddenly mean, OK, it's OK to spend more money in the, this environment. So I think you'll see more fiscal spending globally over the next few years than you have seen, you know, in the previous decade. And that should help to get bond yields and inflation higher, which is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Well, but Trevor, to that point, we've had fiscal spending, quite a great deal of it here in the U.S. There's potentially more on the way. Congress is working on it right now, and yet we have a 10-year yield that's hovering in and around 130 and has been for some time now. So what will be the catalyst for higher Treasury yields specifically? I think it's the, the, the re-acceleration of growth. So at the moment, you've got a slowdown going on that people are almost not talking about because it's so obvious. And it's the slowdown caused by reopening. You, know, you, you reopen, you get back to, to full capacity, um, and, and then suddenly you're at a normal, normal trend growth rate thereafter. The markets don't know what that trend growth rate looks like. I think it's going to be strong. With the fiscal spending you mentioned, with all of the monetary policy sloshing around, I think next year we're going to see quite strong growth. And as the market realises that the reopening slowdown is over and actually growth is still looking pretty strong as far as the eye can see, policy will look too loose. Okay. Then I think you'll start to see bond yields move. And, and that will be you know, good for parts of the stock market that want to see sustained strong growth. Yeah. But the, the very expensive uh, growth stocks are going to struggle in that environment, I think. But while we're talking about the stock market, Trevor, obviously you're looking ahead to next year. But for the remainder of the year, do you think we're going to actually get a correction of 5% drawdown? 
I think so, but I've been saying that for the last three months. I thought over the summer we would probably see that. You, you do have a really big disconnect at the moment between economic surprises, which are coming in negative because of the, the reopening slowdown, and earnings forecasts, which are still being upgraded. And I, I think the thing that we'll give is the earnings forecast. We'll start to see a, a wave of earnings downgrade, just to get you know, with the fact that growth is slowing towards trend. And I think that could give us a correction. Markets, as you know, are really bad at mid-cycle slowdowns. They don't take them well. At yeah. some point, they say, yeah, we don't care, we don't care. We care. And I think you will see a panic of some, some small kind. Uh, and then probably central banks will step in and, you know, delay tapering or we do care. something. Yeah, we care when we care. Do we also care about gas prices very infrequently, but when we care, we care about that. I just want to uh, take us to that subject because we've got lines coming through from the Kremlin. A Kremlin spokesman saying that a quick start of Nord Stream 2 mm. would ease the European gas crisis. And I think we have charts that illustrate <laughs> the extent of the crisis yeah. that Europe is seeing in terms of gas prices. Is this something on your radar, Trevor? How do you, how do you keep uh, keep tabs on what's going on in gas? Yeah, well, gas and, and commodities generally. I think you're seeing... Um, very limited capital investment in the, in the area, but you're seeing demand pick up strongly. They invested in Nord Stream too. I well, suppose. they certainly that's the, did. That's the Russian point. They, they, they certainly did. Their money now, right? There we yeah. go. But 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 what you're going to see because of um, the decarbonisation that's go, that's going on, you're not going to see a lot of extra new investment. And think, I think we're at the beginning of a, a multi-decade potentially bull market in commodities. Mm. So that will be in the background as another drumbeat of inflation okay. that could, could unsettle bond markets. But yep. I, I don't think this year. Goldman Sachs also with a similar view then, uh, of course, for, for, uh, for a little while. Trevor, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for joining us on set in London. Trevor Greetham, head of multi-asset at Royal London Asset Management. Coming up on the programme, the election in Europe's largest economy is fast approaching. We'll hear from some of Germany's top executives next. We'll get an, update, uh, an update on what it is that the CEOs want to see from the German political elite. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later on today, Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. This is Bloomberg. What we all miss a little bit uh, in the whole election campaign is a clear outline of a European and German growth agenda for 2030. At the moment we have a coalition, we need to have a plan for the next 10 years on how they are going to be as successful as we used to be. We have to strengthen uh, the EU's competitive position and to use also um, all the um, funds that have been um, set up now in order to cope with COVID and to recover. We can only be competitive also here in Europe if we also transform our industries. And those are some of Germany's top executives calling on the country's next government to lay out a clear plan to keep it competitive. Let's get the latest on the German elections with Berlin Bureau Chief Birgit Yenin. So Birgit, um, how does it look right now in terms of um, the possibility for a winner? I guess Schultz is ahead. What kind of coalition does it look like he would choose? I think if he has a choice, he probably is going to go with the Greens. It's, it's their natural partner. Uh, but given that Scholz also is aware that he, you know, of, of aware of what really business wants and what we just heard is that, yes, I think he also would like to have the liberals on board because that would give him space also to basically push ahead with some kind of reform agenda. Is it Schultz's race to lose at this point or is it tightening? Well, I would say it's tightening. And we have to be aware that um, sort of when, when Merkel was elected, um, there was also a lot of volatility. And in the end, the polls weren't exactly right. They, they showed then um, a massive lead, um, uh, which actually slimmed down on election night. And we have to be aware the lead of the SPD isn't that big. You know, sometimes it's five or six, but that is really the utmost. And it's narrowing down at the moment. So we should also be prepared for a surprise turnaround maybe at the, uh, on election day. 
how crucial is foreign policy or not, Birgit, here? Because we heard during that uh, debate with various CEOs from Germany, uh, it was uh, Joe Kayser was talking about not wanting German business to get caught between China and the United States. The SAP CEO uh, saying that that needed to be a focus as well. You need to build bridges. There's no, there's no winning in being in isolation. Is there anybody, though, on the Germany ticket or any of those rainbow coalitions? There are so many possible coalitions. Anybody who would really reset things from a China relationship perspective? Or do they all have quite a common view? I mean, I, I think what, what Kaiser has been uh, stressing, and he's, he's right that really um, this is not, has not come up a big in this um, election campaign. And it is basically at the moment a little bit below the radar. Nobody really wants to go into foreign policy talking about it because that is not with what you're going to win election. But it's true that really um, there is a decision out there. Um, I think um, under Sh uh, uh, Scholz's government, the, the course was probably going to continue that way. He's very close to Merkel on that way. I mean, there would not be um, in any way a decoupling and, and basically one would take a very mercantile view on the relationship to China. But I do think that um, depending on um, um, if there would be a Laschet-led government, one has to see where, how the uh, CDU is going to position because you do see sort of more and more people who are calling here also to take a much stronger stand against China, especially um, creating a little bit more independence. So we, we have to see that, how, where this is going to go. Yeah, really interesting to see then in a German context, and on that point in particular, who represents the continuity candidate? Birgit, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Birgit Yen and joining us there from Berlin. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with the EU Trade Commissioner, Valdis Dombrovskis. A trade between Europe and the United States, no doubt, on the agenda there. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in for Francine Lacroix this morning in London. Matt Miller also with me in London. Kaylee Lines is with us in New York. Now, ECB President Christine Lagarde says the economy is recovering faster than expected and she now expects the euro area to reach pre-pandemic output levels before the end of the year. She spoke exclusively to Bloomberg's David Rubenstein. Europe is recovering more rapidly than we had anticipated. And we have, as a result of that, uh, significantly upgraded our projections. So our projection for this year is plus 5%. So it's a significant upgrade, uh, plus 4.6% 4, 4 next year, and uh, back to sort of a pre-COVID type of, of growth uh, subsequently. But this year is certainly going faster than we had thought, to the point uh, where we will have recovered to pre-COVID-19 uh, levels before the end of the year, 2021. We had anticipated it would be early 22 at best. It's now going to be in 21. Well, are you worried about the Delta variant Im impacting what you've just said or the so-called Mu variant, which is now something that's on the horizon? Mm. It, it's very closely related. We used to say that the best economic policy was an accelerated vaccination rollout. Well, we are still uh, in that situation where vaccination matters enormously. But on that front, Europe has done quite well. Uh, we have more than 70% of the, of the adult population that is completely vaccinated in the Euro area. And some countries are doing actually better than that in excess of 80%. Uh, that, that has been a significant boost uh, for growth, and it has helped governments not go back to uh, the stringent containment measures that we had seen previously. Uh, you put together a package that was designed to uh, make Europe uh, solve their economic problems as it dealt with COVID. The United States had a similar package. Um, in hindsight, would you say the package worked as well as you thought, not as well, or better than you thought? You know, when we put it together, we, we were hopeful that it would work. But, you, you, you know, truth of the pudding is in the eating. And uh, it was a matter of days before we really uh, appreciated that message was received. Fiscal authorities began to act in tandem and in good coordination as well. And I think the impact of next generation EU, when all Europeans decided to go and borrow together jointly, 
uh, these, these, this entire package actually uh, responded well and fast and big uh, to the unbelievable crisis situation that we faced. So all in all, I think it, it worked um, well, and it certainly, we responded, I think, faster and better than we had in 2008 and then in 2011 in the European sovereign debt crisis. That was ECB President Christine Lagarde speaking exclusively on the David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations. You can catch that full interview tonight at 9 p.m. in New York. But you can also catch Mr. Rubenstein later on Bloomberg Surveillance. He will be joining Tom Keen, and Tom joins us now. So, Tom, what's your first question to Mr. Rubenstein about his conversation with Madam Lagarde? Well, my first question is, what you learn? Because we didn't learn all that much from the press conference here a number of days ago, and we look forward. John Farrow, I know, is really focused on this. December. Kaylee, what I would do is look at where we are right now. A chart can tell a thousand words within the politics of Christine Lagarde. She can't really talk about where we are. The German 10-year yield, and yes, it went down to a negative level, but with really significant rising inflation, has an inflation-adjusted yield out to a fiction. It's well out over four standard deviations. It's a general guideline in finance. If you're out over four standard deviations, bad things happen. So that's a challenge she and everyone else has in Europe. You know, I uh, loved seeing David <coughs> Rubenstein's interview with Ron Barron yesterday, who says, we saw an opportunity to give Elon Musk $350 million. Now we have $4 billion. If I pull up a comp screen on Tesla versus Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, they just crush everybody, Tom. And I've never really heard your take on that. What do you, what do you think about well, I'm not the, give the you my take. I'm Tesla. not going to give you my take on Tesla, but I am going to say, is this a car company or a tech company? And you're comparing it with other tech companies, which is probably uh, more apt, because that's the enthusiasm that you have for Tesla uh, right now, is the technology of it, the engineering of it, the electricity of it, uh, versus you know comparing it to Ford. Tom, thank you. Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, that show, of course, follows this one. And now, uh, now a look at what else we are watching. And Kaylee, we talked about this a little bit at the top of the at the top of the program. SpaceX, that launch, that's clearly on your agenda. Yeah, absolutely. They will be carrying the first civilian private space uh, flight into orbit. An all civilian crew, the Inspiration 4 mission. They'll be aboard a Dragon spacecraft mounted on top of a Falcon 9 rocket, and it will take off from the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida, this evening. The launch window, I believe, opens at 8 p.m. Eastern time. They're going to orbit the Earth, hopefully for three days. But of course, this is an all civilian crew, guys. No professional. NASA trained mm. astronauts will be on mm -hmm. board. So it's really high stakes, but also, Matt, could be a major step forward for commercial space flight. Well, and think about how many mega tech, uh, mega cap tech stocks this brings together because it is going to be a Netflix series mm. on a SpaceX launch that we will all be watching mm. on our and, Apple TV. And it's a payments. <laughs> billionaire who's paying for it. He's bankrolling all of the others to, to take the flight. Exactly. Uh, he made his... Uh, oh, you're not talking about Elon Musk. No, no. He actually made his first billion on PayPal, right? And then yeah, uh, yeah, you're yeah. talking about Jared. I'm talking about, the, yes, exactly. One of these civilians who is paying for all of the others to go on board, and, and he made all his money in payments. So another All right, tech so it, it's going to be a great thing to watch. Uh, speaking of watch, I'm watching <laughs> for an Apple Watch. I was really hoping to get the new Apple Watch Series 7. Kaylee convinced me that it would be a good thing for my fitness, and I could stand to lose 5 to 15 kilograms. Uh, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to get. I'm going to go over to the Apple Store later today and see if when the Apple Watch 7 is coming out. But, Kayla, you point out um, they, they didn't give a date. They just said, what, yeah. later this fall? Later this fall. I am feeling quite vindicated that I didn't wait for the new watch and replaced my broken one last Friday, Anna. I feel really boring now taking us to, to UK CPI, <laughs> so maybe we should just linger on the Apple story. But I am focused on the CPI number. It was ahead of expectations here in the UK. Uh, a lot of focus on the Bank of England and when we hike rates, so that's what I'm watching. Uh, but crucially, still 1.6 million people on furlough. That ends at the end of September. The problem I have with all these new announcements we get from Apple is that things like camera improvements, my eyes are not good enough to, 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 uh, <laughs> to spot the difference. Anymore. Deadly worse. Anyway, I'm only, uh, we're only mere mortals. So that is it for Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. More surveillance, though, is ahead. This is Bloomberg.